morning, everyone, and welcome to the SCRA webinar, The Path Beyond Patent Issuance, Patent Enforcement and Design Around. Um, I am Matt Bell. I am the moderator and host for this event, and I would like to welcome you all to uh, this webinar. To me, this is an exciting one. Uh, I know that patent topics are usually uh, not considered overly exciting, but um, the fact that uh, we're talking about strategy around patents is, is such an important topic. Uh, someone who's been around this field for quite a long time. Um, this to me is a, an area that I, I consider to be really interesting. Um, it affects everything uh, with patents from you know, your current strategy to what you're gonna do going forward to uh, how many patents should you have and how should you enforce those patents. There's so many decisions based upon this topic. So I am excited to also introduce you to Hunter Freeman with a, a partner with Burr and Foreman, and, uh, also, which is a uh, SC launch resource partner. And um, uh, Burr and Foreman is an IP firm based here in South Carolina. Hunter is based out of Greenville, and he is a, a, a patent litigator in the space and will be uh, filling you guys in on how this all works. So Hunter, I'm gonna turn this over to you and I'm gonna sit back and listen myself and, and hopefully learn a great deal. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for your time today. Looking forward to talking to you a little bit about uh, the path beyond patent issuance, uh, patent enforcement, and design around. And uh, so some of the topics that we will talk about today, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and see the, the slideshow. Uh, this talk assumes that you have either attended the five-part series that SCRA did on the path to patent issuance or that you are familiar with the process and the requirements of getting a patent. If that's not the case, uh, then I would recommend that you either go back and, and watch some of those uh, series from the patent office or, you know, you can, you can give me a call afterwards. Uh, there's a lot of information, so feel free to ask questions at any point in time. I believe there's a Q&A box that you can type your questions in, and Matt will relay them to me throughout the, the presentation. And due to time constraints, I know that this is at a pretty high level. So uh, if you have any offline discussions or, or questions that you want to get into afterwards, feel free to do that as well. Uh, but let's go ahead and dive into this topic. So... The first thing that we're going to look at is how can I tell when my patent has been infringed? And then what do I do when I think my patent has been infringed? Uh, what, are, what is my recourse for the infringement? Uh, and then we'll switch gears into what does it mean when my, my competitor has a, a patent? What does it mean to design around a patent? What are the best practices for doing that? And then what are my options if I can't design around my competitor's patents? So let's uh, start off with what are my rights? Well, patent owners can prevent anyone from infringing their patents. What does that mean? That means with respect to an infringing product or process, uh, a patent owner can prevent third parties from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing into the United States the infringing article or process. And patent owners can sue third parties that are infringing those above patent rights. So th those are what your rights are. So... Uh, the question becomes, what are my first steps after obtaining a patent? The very first thing that you should start doing is if you have a commercial embodiment of your patented product, start marketing it as, marking it as being patented. And the way that you do that is simply by saying patent number, whatever. Uh, and there's a, there's a number of reasons why you want to do that. One, it's, it's a great advertisement and, and uh, the consuming public actually will be positively affected. I don't know why, but the, the consuming public assumes if you have a patent, your product must be better than everyone else's. And hopefully that is the case. Uh, patent marking also puts your competitors on notice of your rights and it keeps the honest competitors honest. But finally, with respect to the competitors that aren't so honest, it preserves your right to recover damages for their infringement. So after marking your own products, you might consider registering your patent with Amazon or other e-commerce companies so that uh, they can either monitor uh, potential infringements for, for you, or when you report the infringement, they have record of your patent and your rights so that it, it sets the basis for, for the complaint. Let's move on to the next slide, which is what is patent infringement and how does it relate to patentability? So as you learned through some of these previous ones, what the process is for getting a patent, infringement is actually somewhat of a reverse relationship to that. So an infringing product or process must contain each and every element or its equivalent that is recited in any one patent claim. 
So when you're getting a patent, you have to prove that you have one additional element than what is being disclosed in the prior art. That's not the case for infringement. The infringement is if you have a widget that has element one, two, three, and four, an infringing element, uh, an infringing product would have element one, two, three, and four. It doesn't matter if it has element five. Whereas to get a patent, all you have to prove is that I have element five, which was not disclosed by the prior art, therefore I'm entitled to a patent. It doesn't matter if you add things uh, that you have an improvement over the patented product, but if you have those elements one, two, three, and four, you're infringing. So it is a little bit of an inverse relationship. And also the materials that are reviewed uh, are different. For patentability, you look at the written description. Does it simply disclose the elements that you are claiming? Whereas infringement, you look solely to the patent claims. And if the accused product falls within the uh, scope of the patent claims, meaning it contains each and every single element or its legal equivalent, then you're infringing. So let's talk a little bit about the types of patent infringement. There's generally speaking, there is direct and indirect. And uh, so direct is your most typical type of infringement. And it's when a single party makes, uses, sells a, a product or process containing all of the patented elements or limitations. Uh, so there are two types of direct infringement, literal infringement, which you can think of as a knockoff where it literally has every single element uh, that is contained in your patent claim or infringement by equivalence, where that means, okay, I've claimed element three. Element three is not exactly in the accused product, but they've got something really, really close. And so is that an equivalent that can constitute uh, uh, that would satisfy that limitation. And then direct infringement is where you have two parties involved. So one party is directly infringing and then one party is uh, indirectly infringing. And the types of indirect infringement that the second party could uh, engage in what would be inducement where someone is actively inducing a second party to, to infringe the patent or contributory where essentially they're selling a necessary part or component that is used to infringe a patent. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, literal infringement. So let's, real simple uh, a product here, a hamburger, and the claims are you've got two slices of bread, uh, cheese slice, edible salad, which we know is lettuce, tomato, or, or any of that, and a meat product. So then we've got some different uh, potentially uh, uh, infringing devices. So at the very top of the, the claim chart, you've got uh, the patented invention with all the different claims. And then we look at the, the, the first accused device, which is accused number one. And you'll notice that it does indeed have two slices of bread. It does indeed have some cheese. It does indeed have some edible salad and does indeed have a meat product. Now you'll notice that the patented hamburger has the cheese on top, whereas the accused product has the cheese being underneath the salad. But that doesn't matter because the patent claim did not uh, claim the order in which they had to be, just that you had to have all four elements. So accused device would literally infringe because it has all of the different uh, elements. But now we go down and look at accused device uh, or hamburger number two, and we notice, well, it doesn't have any lettuce or tomato or anything that could qualify as an edible salad. So does it literally infringe? The answer is no. And then we look at accused hamburger number three, which again, it has everything, but you'll also notice if you look closely that there are some fries and a drink. So they've now added element five and six. Does that get them out of infringement because they have additional elements? No, uh, that is still an infringement, even though that they have some of these additional elements. Um, so even now we move on to the second instance, which is doctrine of equivalence. This is what is used when not everything is literally present, but you still may have an equivalent, something that is relatively close, uh, sufficient to be able to prove infringement so that you can stop your, your competitors from making uh, just very small changes to your patented product uh, and getting around your patent. 
The thing is the equivalency analysis is conducted on an element by element basis at the time of infringement. You can't say, well, overall speaking, this, this invention is very close to mine. No, you have to look at, do you have element one or its little or equivalent? And then the same for element two, three, and four. So the real question in this analysis becomes, well, what is an equivalent? How close does it have to be to be a legal equivalent and that you can stop? Generally speaking, there's kind of a three-part test to that. It says, is the component or element that is slightly different, is it, does it perform substantially the same function as the claimed element? Does it do it in substantially the same way as the claimed element? And finally, does it obtain the same result? If the answer is yes to all those, you're probably going to show that that change, even though it's slightly different, is a legal equivalent and you can stop that. But the, here's where the, the rub is. Uh, the, the equivalence cannot include anything from the prior art. And so oftentimes when people make uh, changes to their, their products, they will, look at, they, will, they will look to what you have done during the prosecution history of your patent. What changes did you make to the claims uh, in terms of narrowing the scope of your patent in order to obtain a patent? And so prosecution estoppel says that basically whenever you narrow a claim, a patent claim in response to a piece of prior art that's being cited against you by the patent office, the patentee is uh, stopped from later arguing that the subject matter covered by the original broader claim is an equivalent. So basically another way of saying that is that everything between the original broad claim and the more narrow amended claim is no longer eligible to be an equivalent. So if someone is uh, pick something that falls between those claim scopes, then you're probably not gonna be able to stop them from doing that. So let's go back to our, our example of the patented hamburger. So uh, instead of having cheese, let's say that they have cheese flavored sauce or cheese flavored dressing. The question becomes, well, is that close enough to be a, an equivalent? And the answer would be yes, if the cheese sauce is a, a legal equivalent to cheese, then you can stop that. So if you think about like that, that gooey nacho cheese that you get at the baseball stadium, that might be a, a legal equivalent because more or less it's cheese. It's just got some additives in it that makes it real ooey and gooey. But if it's, uh, you know, like a salad dressing that is just flavored like cheese, maybe that's not a legal equivalent. So it's a very fact uh, intensive question. But just know that not every single element has to be exactly the same as the way you claim in order for you to be able to stop. So now we're moving on to what happens if not a single person is involved in infringement? What happens if, because a lot of times what's going to happen is it might be your customer who is infringing your patent, but you don't want to sue your customer. You want to sue your competitor. So you have to look at, well, what role did the competitor play? And this is where indirect infringement uh, comes in. So you ask the question, did my, my competitor induce the customer to infringe? And the statute basically says, whoever actively induces infringement of a patent shall be liable as an infringer. Well, inducement occurs when a party actively and knowingly aids and abets another uh, to directly infringe a patent. But the key is that there must be one party who is putting out a product or process that infringes the patent by having all the elements. So just because your, your uh, competitor is trying to get people to infringe your patent, it doesn't count unless that competitor is successful in doing it. The other requirements are that the competitor needs to know of your patent. And again, another reason to start marking and advertising the fact that you have a patent. And the competitor needs to know, or it should know, that its inducement would be, result in the direct infringement of the patent. So some examples of what a competitor could do to be liable for inducement of infringement is, for instance, if they assemble the products for the client, or if they advertise or show infringing uses of a product, or give instructions on how to build a device that would infringe a patent. While your competitor is not technically infringing, they are certainly inducing someone to do that. So those are the types of, uh, of uh, activities that you can stop your competitor from doing. Now, another way that a competitor could, uh, could 
cause one of your customers to infringe is they could sell a single component, maybe a replacement part that that replacement part gets used to either build a machine or to replace a part in a machine. And when included with the, the, the other parts of the machine, that machine now infringes your patent. So can you stop your competitor from selling those components that would be used to infringe your patent? The answer is yes, if uh, the component being sold by your competitor is a material part of the invention uh, that was especially made or adapted for use in an infringement uh, and is not a staple article that is suitable for a substantial non-infringing use. And again, it actually has to have been used uh, for direct infringement. So where the fight really comes down to in this is generally, is this part, uh, was it specially made or adapted for use in infringement? And that really rolls into the same question about, well, does it have any substantial non-infringing uses? And the question there, uh, about a substantial non-infringing use says, look, the non-infringing use, it can't be uh, unusual, far-fetched or illusory. It, it really focuses on both the practicality and the frequency of this use. So if someone is selling a very commonly used part that can be used in a bunch of different machines, uh, many of which don't infringe your patent, the mere fact that it is now going into a machine that would infringe your patent is not going to get you there. But if this part is made specifically to go into your patented machine, then you're gonna be able to stop that competitor from selling those replacement parts. So what do you do when you have evidence that, that you think that your patent might be infringed? You see a product being sold out on the market and you say, wow, this looks a lot like what we just developed. What do we do? Well, go out and first get, get the accused device, take a photograph of it, Go buy it if you can buy it, but, but get, a, get more information on this device. And the reason is that you need to compare the accused device to the patented claims. You probably want to hire an attorney to do this, but if you at least want to take the first pass at it, you can certainly do that. And what you would do is you would prepare a claim chart, kind of like we did on a couple slides ago with the, the hamburgers, and you literally say, okay, element one, element two, element three, element four, and you look at the accused device and you start pointing it out and you say, well, is element one there? And, and you start putting check marks or X marks. And for any X marks, you've got to be able to say either there is an equivalent to it or it's literally there. Um, so once, once you've done that, I think the next step would typically be to send a demand letter to the infringer. Uh, or, and again, you might want to hire an attorney for this, but if you want to send out the initial communication, that, that's fine. And typically the very first thing you're going to ask in that demand letter is stop. Don't do this anymore. Stop infringing my patent. The other things you may want to look at, and that, and that would typically be your injunctive relief. The other thing you may want to look at is how, how much is this damage you? You may want to ask for money from them. You, and that money could be in the form of a royalty or lost profits that you should have made. Uh, you could also, instead of saying, I want you to completely stop, you might say, well, I'll let you keep doing this, but you're going to have to pay me a license fee or royalties moving forward. And in some instances, you might even say, you know what, um, you're better equipped to, to make this and this seems more valuable to you than it is to me. I'd be willing to sell you the patent for the right price. Uh, so there, there are a number of different things that you can ask for uh, when you reach out to, to stop the infringement. And then finally, if that doesn't work, you, uh, you can file a lawsuit. Now for that, you really do need an attorney. And the reason being is that when you file a lawsuit, uh, there are certain requirements uh, and rule 11 is, is something that says by signing a lawsuit, you're certifying that to the best of that person's knowledge, information and belief that is formed after a reasonable uh, inquiry that's reasonable under the circumstances that the purpose of the, the document is not improper, the illegal assertions are not frivolous and the factual contentions uh, do or are likely to have factual support. And what the courts have said is that it, to be able to satisfy that duty, you have to have had an attorney do some sort of investigation. So this time, 
doing it on your own is not going to satisfy your, your requirements. So if you file a lawsuit on your own, which you can only do as an individual, you can't do it on behalf of your corporation, and you end up being wrong, you might end up having to pay attorney's fees to the other side for, for failing to do your pre-filing investigation. So if you get to the point of filing a lawsuit, there's no more hire an attorney question mark. It's a hire an attorney exclamation point. You've got to do it. Um, so let's see. So what would be your monetary remedies for patent infringement? We talked about, generally speaking, there's two types of remedies, monetary and non-monetary. And so the baseline uh, remedy for patent infringement is a reasonable royalty, which is there's a, a 15 factor test that, that basically tries to fabricate uh, a, a, a hypothetical uh, a license negotiation between a willing licensor and a willing licensee. We know at this point, that that uh, scenario really doesn't exist. You're you're now a patent holder and infringer, but it tries to figure out what the market value of a reasonable royalty would be. If you don't want to go for a reasonable royalty, you can go for your lost profits. Uh, there are typically four things that you have to look at. One is their demand for the, the product. Two, and this is where the the real fight comes in, are there is there an absence of a non infringing substitute so that but for your sales of this they would have to come and buy it from me. Uh, then you also have to prove that you had the capacity to uh, satisfy the demand, and then obviously you have to prove the amount of profit you would have made on sales. And then finally, another form of damages is your enhanced damage. This, this is for your really bad actors, your willful infringers. And so what the courts can do is they can take whatever damage you are able to prove, whether through reasonable royalties or profits, and they're able to triple those. And then another great thing is they're able to pay for your attorney's fees in the lawsuit because those can rack up. Um, in addition to your monetary relief, you can also get non-monetary relief for patent infringement. And in general, there's two forms. There's a preliminary injunction, which uh, prevents further infringement while the case is pending. This is a really, really powerful form of, uh, of relief because basically what the court is going to say is, we're going to stop you during the pendency of this lawsuit. Right now, even though the patent owner has not proved its case yet, we're just going to stop you from, for, from making those products until we get to the end of the case. And then at the end of the case, we can reevaluate whether the patent owner won or they didn't win. They're hard to get because you're asking for relief before you've actually proven your case. So uh, the courts are hesitant to, to hand these out. Um, but the factors that you would have to prove is a likelihood of success on the merits, saying, look, I haven't proved my case, but it's likely that I'm going to be able to. Uh, then you have to look at what kind of irreparable harm are you going to suffer in the absence of a preliminary relief. This is where courts typically deny preliminary injunctions. They, they're, they're of the belief that money can resolve just about anything. Uh, but if you're able to show that you would have permanent uh, loss of market share or something of that nature where simply writing a check would not uh, resolve the problem, then you can satisfy that. And then the last two is that the, the patent owner, his need or her need for an injunction outweighs the potential harm to the infringer and that the injunction is actually in the public interest. And then at the end of the case, you can ask for a permanent injunction, basically saying, I want an injunction for the life of this patent. And uh, the, the elements are pretty similar up uh, to the top, but they're actually a little easier to get because now you've proved your case. However, permanent injunctions uh, have become a little bit more difficult to, to get because there used to be a presumption of irreparable harm, but that's no longer the case. So where you really see permanent and preliminary injunctions handed out is when you have a direct competitor who's infringing your patent. Um, so th those are your non-monetary relief. And, and again, they're, they're, they're pretty powerful forms of, uh, of relief. So that is kind of, I know it's like uh, drinking from a, a fire hose. And if anyone has any questions about you know, infringement, how do I know when it's been infringed? What do I do with uh, once my patent, if I think my patent has been infringed, I'd be happy to answer anything. 
that you might have. Otherwise, we can we can move on to kind of the second part of this talk, which is, okay, what do I do when my my competitor has a patent? So, Matt, do you, are there any questions at this point, or should I just keep on going? We do have one. Um, what is the time frame requirement for taking action? So uh, there is there's basically six years. You can reach back six years uh, from the date of the issuance. Of, well, you can't reach beyond uh, when your patent issued. That's when your rights begin is the, the date of, that you, your patent is issued by the patent office. However, from the point in which the infringement began or which you knew or should have known it began, you can reach back six years from that date. So you've got a little bit of time uh, to, to figure out what you want to do. So um, moving now to kind of design arounds. This is the question that you ask. Basically, my competitor has a patent. What are my options? Well, obviously you can infringe on there. You can simply make a knockoff and start selling it, but that, that's not a great option for, for all the reasons that we just discussed. Uh, you could seek a license from your competitor, uh, but then you've got to ask yourself, is, is my competitor gonna be willing to license this technology at all? Uh, if it is, am I going to be able to afford, uh, afford the royalty payment that's going to be demanded? Or am I simply drawing unwanted attention to myself about my desire to either uh, enter into this, this space? Uh, if you didn't want a license, you could again say, hey, I just want to buy the patent outright. Uh, same three questions that you're going to have is basically, are they going to be willing to sell? Can you afford it? Uh, and if not, or do you really want to even make the ask? And the final one is design around. So come up with something that, that doesn't fall within the scope of their patent claims and that doesn't infringe. So what does it mean to design around a patent? Um, design around patents are products or processes that are typically developed in light of a patent and that typically work in the same way or achieve the same goal. Uh, they always try to uh, avoid infring infringement. Successful design arounds do that. Unsuccessful ones uh, end up getting sued for patent infringement and losing. Uh, and how we talked about the doctrine of equivalence and prosecution history estoppel earlier, that's typically where you're going to find the design around. So what you're going to do is you're going to go back and look at the history of your competitor's patent. And you're going to look at how they amended their patent claims. And anytime they made it narrower, you're going to ask yourself, is there something that I can change that would fall in between that original broader claim and the new uh, more narrow claim? And if I can find something that will achieve my goal of, of, find, of you know, taking away some market share, then I probably found myself a pretty good design around. And design arounds are real, uh, real uh, effective and, and useful because they're often cheaper due to the cost savings because you didn't have to do all the R&D. And so the question about design arounds is, is really important both as to patent owners and competitors because as a competitor, you wanna know how to design around it. And as a patent owner, you want to know what your competitors are gonna be trying to do so that when you uh, work with your attorney and get a patent, you can try to draft that patent to leave as little room as possible to design around it. So now that we know what it is, let's talk about, you know, in theory, uh, just morally speaking, is, is designing ar uh, around a patent, is it wrong legally or morally? No, not really. So you gotta remember in the United States, we don't like monopolies. We actually have an antitrust act that, that prevents monopolies from occurring. But patents are an exception to that antitrust act. They are limited monopolies that the government grants to uh, patent owners. Why do they do that? Well, the government's not gonna give you anything for free. And so there's a, pre a quid pro quo that they have. And they say, look, if you will put out in the public record how you make and use your device so that uh, a person having ordinary skill in the art, facita, uh, would be, enabled such that he or she could make uh, the invention without undue experimentation, we'll give you a patent. 
And there's really two reasons that the government does that. One, it ensures that the inventor's only getting protection for the stuff that the inventor actually conceived of and, and, and possessed the knowledge about. But two, it also teaches other inventors. You, you hear that you're standing on the shoulders of giants and stuff like that. Well, that's what patents are meant to do that, so that someone can read the patent and say, oh, this is a mousetrap. That's pretty, pretty clever. I think I can make a better mousetrap after reading this and having my knowledge. So I'm going to go out there and make improvements on the technology. But if you get it wrong, you could expose yourself to quite a bit of liability. So uh, let's look at kind of how do you actually do this? The first thing that you would do is you would uh, identify the patent or patents at issue. Uh, most of the time, you're going to have a competitor who has a patent, so identifying the actual patent isn't uh, going to be that much of a challenge. But if you just have a, an invention and you want to make sure that you're not stepping on anyone's toes, you can conduct what's a, called a freedom to operate search. And that basically gives you the landscape of here are all the patents in the field of art that you're actually uh, designing in. And so here are the things you can't uh, do. And by inverse, once you know what you can't do, you know what you can do. Um, and then once you have the patents at issue, you identify the limitations that, that can be uh, either omitted completely or changed uh, in the design around product. And like we talked about before, the best place to look is to check the prosecution history for any sort of narrowing claim amendments that are included in there, because that's that's your roadmap for designing around a, a patent, because it's gonna tell you, this is the, the gray area that they can't enforce. So find something that falls within this gray area and you should be okay. Uh, and then incorporate those changes into a design around patent. But please, 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 once you think you have a design around patent, please get a legal opinion. And the reason for that is, one, just to make sure if the attorney says close but no cigar, you, you might need to go back to the drawing board and, and, and keep, keep at it. But the other reason is that if you get sued for patent infringement, which you might uh, with the design around, um, you know, the patent owner may disagree with your, your analysis. Remember how we talked about the enhanced damages for willful infringement? Well, if it comes out that you intentionally tried to design around a patent, but you never got an attorney to take a look at the end product to tell you whether you actually did it, the chances of you getting popped by the court with those treble damages and or attorney's fees uh, is pretty good. So please get a legal opinion before you start selling your design around. Hunter, two uh, questions real quick on that. Sure. Okay. One is, should you do that with your own patent applications? Uh, you know what, like I said, the now I don't know if, if I would go through the trouble of designing around it, but it, while, while you have the ability to file additional patent applications, so while the original patent application is pending, doing the analysis of, all right, well, wait a second, when I, whenever I write patents, when I'm writing both the written description uh, that have to support the claims and then writing the claims themselves, I always try to think of, okay, what, what are the changes that a competitor can make? And certainly the inventor is going to have that information. So I have a lot of detailed discussions about, okay, what are the small changes we can make here? How else could we achieve this goal? You know, because you don't want to just claim the invention so narrowly that you could make these small changes. The, the, the point is to get the bubble of protection as broad as you can. So yes, going through that analysis of, if I'm a competitor, how am I going to get around this? And then trying to plug those gaps, that's a great strategy. Uh, second question, is freedom to operate a legal document or a professional opinion assessment? Uh, it, it's a, if it's not in writing, I, I would be a little concerned if it's not in writing. But yes, it's, it's essentially an opinion that, that uh, generally an attorney, but uh, someone is basically going to go out there and typically when we do one, we hire professional searchers that do nothing but look for prior art, both for reasons of patentability uh, and infringement. And so they go gather all the prior art, then we look at it, and then we give you an opinion of saying, okay, here are the things that, you know, uh, that your, your design around can do, can't do, and it looks like you might have stepped in it here, or you're, you're clear. So it's an opinion. 
Any other questions? None so far. Please proceed. Okay. Oh, wait, one more just popped in. Uh, how does the freedom to operate differ from an extensive patent uh, pre a search pre-patent? Okay. So, well, uh, again, uh, the, so some of the, the, uh, the prior art revealed by the searches can be the same. But remember, the analysis for infringement is different from the analysis for getting a patent. Remember, when we get a patent, we simply look at the written description of the prior art. And, and remember, the prior art for purposes of getting patents might not just be limited to patents. It can be what's called non-patent literature, too. So all the examiner is going to do is they're going to look to see, OK, is element one generally known in the prior art? Is element two, three, four? And then all you have to do is prove, yes, one through four is generally known in the prior art, but I've got element five, and that's what's novel, and that's what's going to get me in a patent. Uh, now, remember, infringement, they don't care about element five. They are looking, and they're only looking at patent claims. So they look at the claimed language, and they say, okay, do you, does your invention literally fall within one of these, the scope of one of these patent claims? Uh, and so there are different questions. The, the, the prior art references might be the same, but you're asking two different questions. So uh, here's an example of a design around uh, that I was involved in. Um, I was representing the patent owner. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't write the patent. Uh, otherwise, some of this uh, could have um, been avoided. But this brings up two really big points, which is patent marking and patent design around. And we got involved after a, a, a client said, we think someone's infringing our masonry block. And so they had a patent and, uh, you know, they, they talked about, uh, you know, having a top shear lug extending longitudinally across the top surface, which is number 40. Uh, they had an end groove, which is shown as number 46, that goes vertically along one end, and a, an end shear lug, number 42. So, I mean, the, the, the claims were really all about these lugs and grooves and where they were placed on the block. And during the prosecution, uh, they actually added things like the lugs had to have beveled sidewalls and that the grooves had to have a beveled sidewall and that they would have a generally trapezoidal shape when viewed from their end. Um, and so when a competitor basically made a direct knockoff, we sent a letter to the competitor saying, you got to stop. And, you know, we need an accounting to see how many of these things you've sold uh, and, and you're going to have to pay us some money too. And the, the response we got was basically, well, we don't really deny that we completely knocked off your patent. We didn't know that the patent was issued. And it appears that you haven't been marking your own products with your patent number. And so Section 284 of the Patent Act basically says, if you fail to mar mark your patent, uh, then you cannot receive any damages until you've actually notified the infringer of its infringement. So we did that through the letter and they said, that's great, we'll stop, but we don't owe you any money. And at that point in time, I kind of talked to the client, I said, well, we got them to stop, but here's, here's the problem. Uh, they might come back and redesign this block to basically take out the trapezoidal shapes because uh, the the limitations that you have in your patent, they're pretty narrow. I mean, they're, they, they claim a specific shape of these lugs. Well, lo and behold, about six months later, the competitor came back and said, hey, we got a new block. Go ahead and take a look at it. And what we want to point out to you is that, as you can see by the red arrow, we've got the end lug, but it's not trapezoidal. It doesn't have a beveled edge. We've rounded it. The same thing goes for that end groove that is pointed to in green. Again, we've, we've made that semicircular. And as for that top shear lug, we went ahead and gave it a bull nose top. So it, you know, it might generally be trapezoidal, but it certainly doesn't have a beveled edge. And so we looked at it a, a little bit more carefully and lo and behold, what they had done is they had gone back into the prosecution history and they saw that we initially had just claimed these uh, lugs and, and recesses 
and it didn't have anything about their shape whatsoever. It just said, we got them and this is where they're located. And the patent examiner said, that's too broad because I, you know, the prior art discloses that. So uh, unfortunately the client, when they went back, they, they, they picked a pretty narrow um, uh, limitation. In fact, it was more narrow than it needed to be to get around the office action. And so the client asked, well, does it matter? I mean, we could have had a broader claim. And the answer was, no, it doesn't matter. You, you may have picked more narrow than you needed, but unfortunately, everything between that, uh, that claim limitation and the original claim, you've disclaimed. So this was a successful design around, unfortunately, for, for our client. So um, you always want to be careful about when you're when you're drafting patent applications and when you're responding to office actions, you need to make sure that you are picking the limitation that while it gets around the office action, it just barely gets around the office action because anything beyond that, you're just giving up to the public. So uh, what are the alternatives? Let's say that you, your, your, your competitor has a patent and they did the analysis while the patent was pending of let me think of all the ways I could design around this and uh, they, they plugged all the holes. Well, in that case, you are left with trying to invalidate or narrow the patent. And there are a couple ways of doing that. You could institute a challenge in the patent trial and appeal board, which is called the PTAB. Um, and, but the filing fees are pretty expensive. If, if you look at what's called an inter parties review, the filing fees alone are, are 41.5. Uh, and then if you do what's called a post-grant review, filing fees can be up in 47.5. So, I mean, they're not cheap. Uh, but the, the good news about doing that, depending on what side of it is, is you will get an answer in about one year. Uh, and then currently the trends say that about 80% of PTAB challenges result in at least one claim being invalidated and or narrowed. So, if you're on the other side of a patent, um, you know, the, the, the thing is that making it harder to design around uh, can also open your, your patent up to uh, invalidity challenges. So you've got to find that nice, uh, happy medium where you are truly only claiming your invention, but you are completely claiming your invention. Um, the other option for trying to invalidate or narrow a patent is filing a, a federal lawsuit. Uh, and you could file what's called a declaratory judgment action where you say, hey, look, um, you know, this, my competitors got a, a, a patent uh, and they are alleging that they're gonna sue me for patent infringement. And we just don't think that their patent is valid or, or at least not valid as currently written. Um, and, there, you, you need to talk to an attorney about whether you want to do it in the patent trial and appeal board or, or in a district court, because there's a lot of differences in costs, time, the amount of information that the parties are allowed to exchange or require from one another. So you really just need to, to go through that with, with a patent attorney uh, or a litigator and, and figure out what, what makes sense for you. But if you don't want to do that, uh, you could certainly go back to the, let's go get a license or an assignment of the patent. So uh, those are kind of your options or just stay out of the, the area in general. So if, unless there are any questions, that, that kind of uh, concludes the, the presentation portion of this, but I am certainly happy to uh, take any questions that anyone might have. And I'll... I've heard people talk of scientific exemption. So, if you're trying to design around, can you make the product to test it? So, uh, so experimental uses. Uh, yes, experimental uses can be uh, exemptions uh, from, in, from infringement. Uh, again, the, it has a very, very factually uh, intensive question. So my, my advice to anyone uh, that is dabbling in either designing around or using, making, selling any sort of product that you have a, a fear, well, am I infringing? Go talk to someone. The first question is, look, is this going to infringe, period? Uh, and, and the answer may be no. 
Uh, but if the answer is yes, then explore your options, which are, you know, should we try to invalidate this thing? Should we try to design around it? Are there, you know, experimental, what is the, what can I do? What can't I do? And that's going to be a pretty lengthy conversation with uh, your council of choice uh, 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 to ensure that you don't find yourself on the wrong end of a patent infringement policy. All right. Well, Hunter, thank you for your time. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. We appreciate uh, your participation. And we do hope this was a uh, uh, time worth your, worth your while. And uh, we are all here, uh, Hunter and myself. If there's additional questions or follow up that you would like to do, please feel to reach out. Feel free to reach out. And uh, thank you again and have a wonderful day, Hunter. Thank you again. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if, if anyone wants to take a discussion offline, I'm happy to do that. You can see down in the bottom left hand, uh, my phone number is 864-552-9366, or you can email me at hfreeman at burr.com. So thank you very much everyone for your time today.